to an HBC special report. I'm John Adams along with Chris Kendall. And today's special report is titled Girl Power of the Power Elite. Chris, how are you doing today, my friend? I am doing well, and uh, today we are going to talk about women. Uh, a fascinating subject, a very nice subject. Um, but these aren't just your average, ordinary girl next door types. Um, these are people that are in what you would call the, <clears throat> uh, well, the culture creation industry, um, the entertainment industry. And as much as you would like to think that these were the just average person who kind of climbed their way to the top of the heap, it seems that's not really the case in some in some instances. Now, I do know people uh, that have been in bands and that have got signed to major record labels, and they're just your average person who's in a band and gets signed, and nothing really happens to them. Doesn't really don't really become household names or anything. That, um, and although I do think it's possible that a average one of the mill person could become a household name if they um, have some particular star potential that the culture makers want. Mm -hmm. Uh, For the most part, I think that a lot of the the people that we see as the mega stars are actually born and bred to be stars. Now, before I dispense with my information, what would you say to that statement? That they're born and bred to be stars, I, I, it wouldn't, yeah, I mean, it doesn't, uh, doesn't surprise me. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that was too, uh, far fetched as far as an idea. Well, well, let's, let's say this. What if, like, someone had the right connections? They were born into a family and they've already got the right connections. And they just wanted to, say, get into entertainment. Or let's say that entertainment in and of itself, which is the point I'm going to try to make, that entertainment in and of itself is only an extension of some of the stuff I'm going to mention. And um, to dip my toe into it, to get right into it, the reason I thought of of doing this uh, quick little uh, report was because um, around 2011, I took some notes about the Fonda family, Jane, Peter, Henry. And it came to my attention that that Jane Fonda and Peter Fonda, through their mother, Frances Ford Seymour, were related to Henry Huddleston Rogers, the chief executive of Standard Oil under John D. Rockefeller the first. Okay? okay. And her mother, Frances, uh, Jane Fonda's mother, Frances Ford Seymour, uh, is a Ford and a Seymour. As in, they claim, their family, that they are related to the Seymours of England, the wife of Henry VIII. So much so that Jane Fonda is named Jane Seymour Fonda. As in Jane Seymour, the wife of Henry VIII, Right. And the Ford, the Ford and Francis Ford Seymour is the Fords, as in Henry. So Jane Fonda, the feminist, uh, sex goddess, iconoclast of the 1970s, the environmentalist, uh, later to be the mass consumer uh, promoting workout queen of the 1980s, the biggest selling videotape of all time, by the way, available in any thrift store in America right now. Um, she's, they're related to the captain of Standard Oil, the guy who helped start it with John D. Rockefeller, and Henry Ford. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Yeah. On her father's side, on Henry's side, their dad, Henry Fonda, it says that he comes from the he comes from a direct descent of Dutch and Italian royalty. It doesn't specify as what that is, but that's what it says. So they're related 
to royalty on both sides of their family. Now, uh, to get, to dig into this on that note, um, I'm going to read this. I won't say the guy's name first, but I'll say that he was elected a member of the Kentucky House of Representatives for the Kentucky's 98th Legislative District, which encompassed Greenup County. In 1975, he was elected to 11 consecutive terms, serving a total of 21 years until he retired from office in 1996. He served as an executive secretary treasurer of the Kentucky AFL-CIO from 1984 to 86 and was employed as a rigger with Armco Steel Ashland Works. He was a Kentucky colonel, and he served as a regional governor with Alan Greenspan on the Federal Reserve Board and is a former member of the Crownsman Quartet and is a former Little League baseball coach. The gentleman that I speak of, who was a regional governor of the Federal Reserve with Alan Greenspan, is Ray Cyrus, the grandfather of Miley Cyrus. the father of Billy Ray Cyrus. So Miley Cyrus's grandpa was a Federal Reserve Board governor. Okay? All right. Now, have you ever heard the name Charles Schwab? Yes. Okay. There are two Charles Schwabs. Charles Schwab, the financier, who started Charles Schwab in uh, the financial uh, institution in 1987. And then there was Charles Schwab, the the steel magnate, who was uh, at one time the head of the Carnegie Steel Company and uh, broke off or was either sent by Andrew Carnegie to create a little company, you might have heard of it, it's called Bethlehem Steel. Okay. So Charles Schwab, the steel magnate, and Charles Schwab, the financier. Charles Schwab, the financier, he's still alive. He claims that they are not related to each other. He says that they're two, they are two different uh, families entirely. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what he says. Now, Charles Schwab, the steel magnate, was the niece – or uh, I'm sorry, he was the uncle of a, of a lady named Pauline – Perry, okay? And Pauline Perry was the mother of a man named Frank Perry, and he had a sister named Christine Perry. And Frank Perry uh, was a uh, f- was a uh, film director. He was a veteran of the Korean War, and he returned back to the entertainment industry after being discharged and made his directorial debut in 1962 with a film named David and Lisa. Um, he also made films, uh, including The Swimmer, Last Summer, Trilogy, and of course he's most famous uh, for his movies Diary of a Mad Housewife, uh, Carrie Snodgrass, Play It As It Lays, and of course with Faye Dunaway playing Joan Crawford in Mommy Dearest. That's what Frank Perry's known for. Okay. Okay. And uh, Frank Perry has a sister, and his sister is Mary Christine Perry, and she is a pastor who resides in Santa Barbara, California, with her husband, Keith Hudson. And through Keith and Chris, through Christine Perry and Keith Hudson, they bore a daughter by the, who goes by the name of Katie Perry. pop star. So Katy Perry is the great niece of Charles Schwab, the Bethlehem steel magnet. By way of um, Marie Hudson. No, by way of by way of her mom, Christine Perry. Christine Perry. Yes. So Miley Cyrus's grandpa was a Federal Reserve Board chairman. And Katy Perry's uncle was a Carnegie steel magnet. Now, here's the other thing. Frank Perry, her uncle, 
Her uncle, Frank, was married to a lady named Barbara Goldsmith. Barbara Goldsmith was an American author, journalist, and philanthropist. She received critical and popular acclaim for her best-selling books, essays, articles, and her philanthropic work. She was awarded four honoris causa doctorates and numerous awards being elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, two presidential commissions, and the New York State Council on the Arts. Honored by the New York Public Library Literary, Literary, sorry, Literary Lions, as well as the Literacy Volunteers, the American Academy in Rome, the Authors Guild, the Guild Hall, yada, yada, yada. It keeps going. Um, <clears throat> she was born Barbara Joan Lubin in New York City, where you're going to see a lot of people uh, come out of New York City. I was just surprised how New York City keeps popping up all over the place. So does France and um, Connecticut. She received a Bachelor of Arts in 1953 from Wellesley College, where she majored in English, after which she took art courses at Columbia University. Okay, she wrote a whole bunch of books. She started New York Magazine. Okay. She wrote not only about art, but also about colorful characters of the art world. In the third issue of New York Magazine, she wrote a landmark article on Viva, a superstar in Andy Warhol films with accompanying photographs by Diane Arbus. Okay, uh, other notable New York articles include her profiles on the Centennial Metrop Metropolitan Museum of Art and curator Henry Geldshaller's Emerging Artist Exhibit with Heine Waith, Andy Warhol, and Thomas Hoving. Now, uh, Barbara Goldsmith became an advisor to the Hearst Corporation and then senior editor of Harper's Bazaar in 1974. Okay. Um, she has a lot of uh, books that she uh, wrote here, nonfiction. Um, the president of the Carnegie Corporation, Vartan Gregorian, named Barbara Goldsmith along with David Rockefeller Sr. and Brooke Astor in his list of America's 10 most enlightened philanthropists. Okay, so that's Katy Perry's uh, lineage. Is the upper crust of is is uh, robber barons? Coincidentally. Coincidentally. Yes. You know who Lana Del Rey is? Lana Del Rey. Yeah, she's a she's a pop artist as well. Um, I think I've heard of her. Yeah. Yeah, you can look her look her up. Don't bother her. Her music. Mm, yeah. Well, it's a pop, you know. She's got, she's a, she's got a pretty face. Um, of course, Lana Del Rey is not her real name. She was born Elizabeth Woolridge Grant in New York City okay. to, Rob, to Robert England Grant, a gray group copywriter turned entrepreneur, and Patricia Ann Grant, a former gray accountant executive turned high school teacher. Of course, well, I'm reading this. Look up what the gray group is. <laughs> now, she grew up in Lake Placid, New York, and attended a Catholic elementary school, um, so on and so forth, and she becomes a big superstar, Lana Del Rey. This is the interesting thing. The fall, um, she, you know, becomes a co of college age, and she enrolled at Fordham University. You know what Fordham University is? No. It's a Jesuit university. It's for oh, Jesuits. Right, right, right. This is who Lana Del Rey went, went, uh, joins the ranks of notable alumni. Geraldine Ferraro, Andrew Cuomo, William Casey, John Mitchell, former U.S. Attorney, Dwight D. Eisenhower, John Brennan, current director of the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, Jack Keane, retired four-star general and former vice chief of staff to the United States Army and Major General Tom Martin Thomas McMahon, decorated American Civil War officer. Fordham has produced college and university presidents for at least 10 institutions around the U.S., including two for Georgetown, which is also Jesuit, and one each for Columbia and New York University. 
Francis Cardinal Spellman, the late Archbishop of the Metropolitan See of, the, of New York, was also a Fordham graduate. Okay. Okay. Um, Gerald E. Corrigan, former president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Uh, John Leahy, chief operating officer of Airbus. Um, Mario Debelli, billionaire and founder and CEO of G- GMACO Investors. Lorenzo Mendoza, billionaire and CEO of Empresas Polar. Eugene Shiv- Shivdiller, billionaire and international oil tycoon. And billionaire Donald Trump. Did you know Donald Trump went to a Jesuit university? That is just so shocking, John. I just, I, I, I don't know if I can process that. You know who else went there? G. Gordon Liddy. G. G. Gordon Liddy. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think I heard he went to a Jesuit. Now that's now we're all talking. We're we're talking about uh, Fort Fordham University, right? That's correct. Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington. Okay. Taylor Schilling. I don't know who she is, but she's uh, some actress. Uh, Dylan McDermott, award-winning actor. Uh, Alan Alda, award-winning actor. And, of course, Bob Tishan. We know him better as Captain Kangaroo. Yeah, I knew he is up in some... Business there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know Captain Kangaroo went to a Jesuit university? Shocking. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yep. Um, well, let's let's keep it going. Um, Taylor Swift. You know who Taylor Swift is, right? Uh huh. Okay. Uh, Taylor, so this is from an article from Gawker, uh, but it corroborates what's on Wikipedia. Taylor Swift's mother and father are behind-the-scenes monsters. And the title of the article is, Taylor Swift's parents are a-holes. Described by a source as being difficult and controlling stage parents, there are a number of reasons why this isn't surprising. For one, Swift's parents were more elemental in her career than most. When Swift was 14, the family moved from Pennsylvania to Nashville so that she could pursue a career in country music. A Rolling Stone profile from a few years ago said that Swift persuaded her parents to relocate, but the exact story is kind of irrelevant. Any couple willing to move halfway across the country so a kid can pursue musical stardom will obviously have a great deal of investment in her subsequent career. It was a good bet, obviously. That's pretty funny. The Rolling Stone article also described her parents, Scott and Andrea, who, according to page six, have been living separately for years as having business backgrounds, which is true, which is as true as calling them humans. Scott Kingsley Swift is a wealth management advisor and senior vice president at Merrill Lynch, who runs a subset of the firm called the Swift Group. From, his, from the company's Nashville office, his official company bio notes that his daughter, Taylor, is a four-time Grammy winner and CMA Entertainer of the Year. He also lists a number of entertainment ventures, Swift Merchandising, Firefly Entertainment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it, her mother, whose father was an oil man, likewise worked at a mutual fund before becoming a stay-at-home mom. Do we see a pattern forming here? Uh, yeah. You know who Jodie Foster is, right? Jodie Foster, yes. Mm-hmm. Of course, um, uh, John Hinckley just got released from prison. Jodie Foster should maybe be a little concerned about that, right? Well, Jody, she was born in Los Angeles in 1962, the youngest child of Evelyn Ella Brandy and Lucius Fister. Uh, I'm sorry, that's really, it looks like Lucifer. I swear, I, just, I, I keep wanting to say Lucifer. Lucius Fisher Foster the third. Her father came from a wealthy Chicago family whose forebears include John Alden, who had arrived on the Mayflower in 1620. He was a Yale graduate and a decorated U.S. Air Force lieutenant colonel and made his career as a real estate broker. 
Okay. She was a gifted child, learned to read at the age of three. She attended a French language prep school, the Lycée Francia de Los Angeles. Her fluency, her, pardon my French, uh, her fluency in French has enabled her to act in French films, and she also dubs herself in French language versions of most of her English language films. She also understands Italian, although does not speak it, as well as little Spanish and German. At her graduation in 1980, she delivered the valedictorian dress for the school's French division. Although already a successful actor by this time, Foster then attended Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. She graduated magna cum laude in 1985, and she returned to Yale in 93 to address the graduating class and was awarded honorary doctor of fine arts degree. So she, her ancestors are close enough to note that they're on the Mayflower, and they don't say what family her her uh, dad actually comes from, the Fosters of Chicago, if somebody wants to uh, find out what that is. Apparently he's facing 25 years in prison for a housing offense. Convicted oh, really? One counts of grand theft. I'm going to say he, he – I'm going I'm to guess he probably won't. He'll get a slap on the wrist. He sounds like he's pretty connected. Let's see. Who else? Do you know who the actress Carrie Washington is? Uh, no, not familiar. Okay. She, she's a uh, African-American woman. Uh, she's attractive. Um, I, I don't really care about people's acting abilities at this point. It, it just doesn't interest me. I'm not interested in movies or television or anything. But uh, apparently she's on some show called... Uh, Scandal. She's popular for that. I know I've seen her in some movie. I just don't know. Um, she was born in the Bronx, New York City, uh, the daughter of Valerie, a professor and educated you know, consultant, and Earl Washington, a real estate broker, another real estate broker. Her, fa- her father's family is of African-American origin, having migrated from South Carolina. Through her mother, she is a cousin of former U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell. She attended George Washington University, graduating Pi Beta Kappa in 98 with a double major in anthropology and sociology. Always a nice thing to have on your acting resume. Right. But there is another lady who has a similar story because... She also went to school in Maryland, and her name is Amy Schumer. She's a very popular comic these days. I don't find her funny in any way, shape, or form whatsoever. Um, but she she was born in New York City, left New York City to go to the Washington, D.C. area to go to school. And her uncle is Chuck Schumer. That's her uncle. Okay. Crypto Jew, right? Or- I don't know if he's even, he's not even crypto about it. He's pretty much like an open Zionist, I'd say. <laughs> yep. yep, every time. You go to the, start criticizing Zionists. Get disconnected, John. You should know that by now. <laughs> yes. I don't think the Jews run everything, but there's no doubt about it. He's, a, he's definitely some sort of Zionist plant or something like that. He, he's, all, he's always like telling Everybody, he, he's supposed to be a Democrat, but he's all about going and bombing the hell out of the Middle East. But um, Israel can do no wrong, that's for sure. Um, that's a whole different uh, episode altogether. But, yes, it's always nice to have an uncle or a cousin uh, in the government to uh, help out your career. I, I, I don't know. I don't know these things. I'm just, I'm just stating the facts here. You ever heard of the actress Kira Sedgwick? Uh, yes. She's married to Kevin Bacon. Of course, there's six, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, right? You think Kevin Bacon is descended from Francis Bacon? Uh, I would. I didn't know that. Is that true? <laughs> well, I don't believe Francis. I don't believe Francis Bacon was technically one man, but. Uh, I, I wouldn't doubt somebody would claim that. I don't know. I don't know about Kevin Bacon, but I do know that his wife, uh, 
probably just wouldn't pick any guy to marry because the Sedgwicks were one of the families that started, you know, came over here on the Mayflower again and started in New York City. Mm, okay. She was born in New York City. She's the daughter of Patricia, a speech teacher and educational family therapist, and Henry Dwight Sedgwick V, a venture capitalist. Her father was Episcopalian of English heritage, and her mother was Jewish. On her father's side, she's a descendant of Theodore Sedgwick, Endicott Peabody, the founder of the Groton School, William Ellerly, signer of the Declaration of Independence, John Lathrop of Boston, Massachusetts, and is the great-granddaughter of Henry Dwight Sedgwick III, and this corresponding niece to his brother, Ellerly Sedgwick, owner and editor of the Atlantic Monthly. Sedgwick is also a sister of actor Robert Sedgwick, half-sister to jazz guitarist Mike Stern, the first cousin once removed of actress Edie Sedgwick. Of course, Edie Sedgwick was one of uh, was Andy uh, Warhol's muse. She's also the aunt of R&B pop singer George Nozuka and his younger singer-songwriter brother Justin Nozuka. Their mother Holly is Sedgwick's half-sister. Uh, she, gra- she graduated from Friends Seminary and attended Sarah Lawrence College, transferring to the University of Southern California, where she graduated with a theater degree. Always helps to have a family who helped start the city of New York. Let's see. Glenn Close. You know who Glenn Close is? Uh, yes, huh? Fatal Attraction. Who could forget? Um, of course, um, there was a fun. I got I got sent something funny not uh, not too long ago where uh, they were saying that uh, Glenn Close uh, bears a strong resemblance to George Washington. Remember that? I think I forwarded you that. Yeah, uh-huh, we talked about that. Yeah, looks, looks a lot like old George. Striking. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting because uh, she was born and raised in Greenwich, Connecticut, in 1947 the daughter of William Talaferro Close, a doctor who operated a clinic in the Belgian Congo, served as a personal physician to Mobutu Siseko and socialite Etienne Moore Close. Her father was a descendant of the Taliaferros of Virginia. Her paternal grandfather, Edward Bennett Close, a stockbroker, another stockbroker, and director of the American Hospital Association. They were first ma- he was first married to post serials heiress Marjorie Merriweather Post. Post is also a second cousin once removed of actress Brooke Shields. Shields' great-grandmother, Mary Elise Moore, was a sister of Close's maternal grandfather, Charles Arthur Moore, Jr. Okay. When her parents were seven years old, or um, when her parents, when she was seven years old, her parents joined a cult, the MRA, the Moral Rearmament, in which her family remained involved with for 15 years, living in communal centers. Close had stated that the family struggled to survive the pressures of a culture that dictated everything about how we live our lives. She spent time in Switzerland when studying at St. George's School in Switzerland. Close traveled for several years in the mid to late 60s with an MRA singing group called Up With The People. Remember that? Up with the people. She also attended Rosemary Hall, now Choate. Graduated in 65. When she was 22, she broke away from the MRA and attended the College of William and Mary and double majoring in theater and anthropology. Everybody majors in anthropology. Mm-hmm. She is Pi Beta Kappa and uh, received an honorary Doctor of Arts degree at William and Mary. Now, who was Glenn Close's father? William Taliaferro Close, an American surgeon, played a major role in stemming a 1976 outbreak of the Ebola virus in Zaire, the first major outbreak of the viral hemorrhagic fever in, fever in Central Africa, and preventing its further spread. He was also the father to actress Glenn Close, husband of Bettine Moore Close. He was born, he was born in Greenwich, Connecticut on June 7th, in 1924. He had a twin brother who is an attorney, and his mother was a descendant of the Talia Farrow family. Okay, and if you go and see who the Talia Farrow family is, 
They basically like helped start the state of Virginia. And they were so close with Thomas Jefferson that when Thomas Jefferson went to Italy, they asked him to like go to their town and look up their family lineage for him. So Glenn Close may as well just be George Washington. He was also in the U.S. Army Air Force during World War II. He served as a personal pilot for interpreter Joseph, an interpreter for Joseph Harper, a general. Following his military service, he attended the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. He trained in surgery at Roosevelt Hospital in Manhattan. He traveled to Zaire in 1960, where he practiced medicine and ran the 1,500-bed Mama Yemo Hospital in the capital city of Kinshasa. Kinshasa, with the goal of getting health care into rural areas of the country. He served President Mobutu Seseko as his personal doctor. In the mid-70s, the Ebola virus broke out at a missionary hospital in, in Yambuku near the Ebola River. The disease, which characterizes by several sore throat, rash, abdominal pain, bleeding from multiple sites, allegedly. Um, uh, Dr. Close returned to Kinshasa from Geneva discussing the issue on the flight with two physicians from the center, uh, from the CDC, Joel G. Bremen and Peter Piot, who discovered the Ebola virus. Um, yeah. yeah. Blood samples that Close had collected in the 70s were used to investigate the process of the AIDS pandemic, showing that the rate of infection had been stable at 0.8% by comparing new samples to the older ones that had been collected in Zaire, one of the few sets of historical specimens available to perform this analysis. This showed that HIV infection rates could have been stable in rural Africa before it spread throughout the world. Yeah, because HIV causes AIDS, right? Now, this here's another interesting thing. Uh, Nicole Kidman, you know, married to Tom Cruise for a bit, good-looking actress. You know who I'm talking about. I think so, yeah. Uh, Kidman was born in Honolulu, Hawaii, while her Australian parents were temporarily in the United States on educational visas. Her father was Anthony Kidman. A biochemist, clinical psychologist, and author who died of a heart attack in Singapore, age 75. Um, her mother, Janelle Ann, is a nursing instructor who edited her husband's books and was a member of the women's electoral lobby. Now, the women's electoral lobby in Australia is basically like the second wave feminist movement in Australia. Okay. And... Uh, Kidman has been a goodwill ambassador for UNICEF since 94 and for UNIFEM, the United Nations uh, International Thing for Women. Uh, she was made a companion of the Order of Australia and is the highest paid actress in the motion picture industry in, in the year of 2006. As a result of being born in Australian parents in Hawaii, Kidman has dual citizenship and she founded her own production company, Blossom Films. In the late 60s, her husband, or her dad, uh, Anthony Kidman, moved to Washington, D.C. to work at the National Institute of Mental Health at St. Elizabeth Psychiatric Hospital. He returned to Australia in the early 70s to take up a position as lecturer in the biochemistry at Monash University. Uh, he moved to the University of Technology at Sydney in 72 and worked there until his death. He established the Foundation for Life Sciences a nonprofit organization focused on youth mental illness. Uh, he was trained in incognitive behavioral therapy and became a clinical psychologist. In 1985, he established the Health Psychology Unit at the University of Technology, from where he conducted research into the biological and psychological aspects of cancer. Um, I'm guessing that dude is... Uh, MK Ultra of some sort. He's a biochemist and a clinical psychologist. That's my yeah. <laughs> and he worked at St. Elizabeth's. Now, why is St. Elizabeth's so significant? Because that's where they ran the uh, MK Ultra stuff out of. 
Oh. Okay, yeah, right. Same thing. <laughs> yeah, so happens. Just so happens these guys have daughters who turn out to be actresses. Of course, um, Brooke Shields was uh, Glenn Close's cousin, right? Of course, you remember Brooke Shields, right? Growing up in the eighties, yes. Who could who could forget Blue Lagoon, right? Right. Um, her dad is Francis Alexander Shield, the businessman, and through her father's side, she has Italian, French, Irish, and English roots, along with high social position and relations to nobility. According to researcher William Adams Wright Weisner, published in 1995, Shields has an ancestral link with a number of noble families from Italy, and in particular from Genoa and Rome. <laughs> These are namely in chronological order of descent from 1355 to 1965. The Gadolesi Paleologos Savoy Grimaldi Imperiali Carafa, Doria, Doria, Pamphil, Landi, Chigi, Albani, and Torlonia dynasties. Her paternal grandmother was the Italian princess Donna Mar Marina Torlonia. Donna Marina was the daughter of an Italian nobleman and American socialite. Did you know that about Brooke Shields? Uh, no. Did not know that, no. Of course, there's a very popular actress to, uh, today. Um, I'm not familiar with any of her work, uh, but her name is Cara Delevingne. Okay. okay. She's, a, she's a youngster. And she was born in Hammersmith, London. She's the daughter of Pandora Ann Delavanine and property developer Charles Hammer Delavanine. She grew up in Belgravia, London, one of the wealthiest districts in the world. Delavanine has two older sisters, Chloe and Poppy. Her godfather is Condé Nast executive Nicholas Coleridge, and her godmother is actress Joan Collins. Delavanine's maternal grandfather was publishing executive and English heritage chairman Sir Jocelyn Stevens the nephew of magazine publisher Sir Edward George Warris Halton and the grandson of newspaper proprietor Sir Edwin Halton, first baronet. Her paternal great-grandfather was British politician Hammer Greenwood, first Vice Count Greenwood, and her maternal grandmother Janie Sheffield was lady-in-waiting to Princess Margaret. Through one of her maternal great-grandfathers, Sir Lionel Lawson Faudel Phillips, third baronet, Delavanine descends from the Anglo-Jewish Faudel Phillips baronets. Two of her ancestors on that line served as Lord Mayor of London. And yet, these women choose to become actresses. Yeah, why actors? You know, um, you ever heard? Of, you ever heard of the band Florence and the Machine? Florence and the Machine. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think so. Well, the singer, her name's Florence uh, Leonatine Mary Welch, was born in Camberwell, London, on the twentieth of August, nineteen eighty-seven. Her father is Dean Russell Welch, an advertising executive. Her mother, Evelyn Welch is an American immigrant from New York who was educated at Harvard University and the Warburg Institute, the University of London. Evelyn is currently Professor of Renaissance Studies and Vice Principal for Arts and Sciences at King's College London. She is she's the niece of satirist Craig Brown, Via Brown's wife and Welch's uh, aunt Frances Welch, and granddaughter of Colin Welch, former deputy editor of the Daily Telegraph and former Daily Mail parliamentary sketch writer originally of Cambridgeshire. Welch's uncle is actor John Stockwell. During her youth, she was encouraged uh, by her paternal grandmother, Sybil, to pursue, pursue her performing and singing talents. Okay, so she was encouraged to do that by her upper crust upbringing. When, 
in all in all the movies that you see about like people who want to pursue these careers, isn't it always frowned upon? Like, oh, you're not going to be the debutante. You're going to go be a singer. This is ridiculous, right? Right. That's how it's always portrayed. The final one I'm going to mention here. Oh, and the one I want to mention just for just for uh, good humor is Stevie Nicks. And if you see the story, you hear the stories about Stevie Nicks, about how her and Lindsey Buckingham were kind of starving in the beginning before they got introduced to Mick Fleetwood and joined Fleetwood Mac, which was a blues band before they became the pop sensation. Um, and a pretty darn good one at that. Um, there's the stories that, that her and Lindsey Buckingham are starving and they're living off the charity of like some of the producers uh, at the Sound City studio and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Yet her, yet her dad was the president of Greyhound Armor Dial. Okay, which is a which was like back in the days before they just came up with these mega these uh, mega corporations that we have now. They used to conglomerate the mega corporation and put the name all into one. So it's Greyhound mm -hmm. Armor Meats and Dial Soap. Right, Stevie Nicks' dad was the president of Greyhound Armor Dial. Okay, yeah. So she probably probably wasn't really I mean, for money. I wouldn't think. I mean, don't you think he could have like hooked her up with a bus ride, some soap, and some deli meats if she really needed it? <laughs> All right, last one here. Ready? And then I'm going to get your take on it um, uh, for the uh, final segment here. Marcella Fazy was born in Umbria in 1911. In 1937, she became the second wife of the widowed nobleman Paolo Borghese, Duke of Bomarzo and Prince of St. Angelo of San Paolo and acquired the title of princess. She gave birth to twin boys, Francesco and Livio, the same year. She was fashion conscious. I'm sorry, fashion conscious. She <clears throat> she had uh, toiletries, including makeup made specifically for her using the natural ingredients found around the Villa Borghese in Rome, where the family lived. She wanted to create a... Okay, she just gets this idea. She wanted to create a line of lipsticks and a wider variety of shades than what was available at the time, and once Pope Pius XII gave the cosmetics his blessing, she pushed forward with the idea. Uh, John, give me this name one more time. This, this person. Uh, Borghese. It's uh, uh, Marcella Borghese. B-O-R-G-H-E-S-E. In, 19, in 1956, she met cosmetics magnet Charles uh, Revson, the founder of Revlon. The two struck up a lifelong friendship as he helped her to create a cosmetics line, which Revlon then licensed under the Princess Marcella Borghese brand name. One of Princess Marcella Borghese's first collections included brightly colored lipsticks and nail colors to match the vivid colors of her friend, uh, fashion designer Emilio Pucci's knitwear. Her Monte Catini cosmetic line, named after her favorite spa, an ancient town in Tuscany, <laughs> used the purported healing properties of the Terme di Monte Catini mud and the mineral waters. The princess was one of the first people to create a skincare line which was based on the natural therapies of a spa. How's that for a culture creation? And that's probably when you talk about stuff like that, it's probably the biggest mm -hmm. money, one of the biggest money making things going. Facial creams exactly. and crap like that. Exactly. In 1992, Revlon sold the Borghese brand to Halston Borghese International Limited, which is like, you know, mega corporation conglomerate, uh, a new company set up in New York by four Saudi investors to buy and hold Revlon's Halston and Princess Marcella Borghese divisions. Borghese, remained involved in the line until 
uh, her death. Today, the company is known simply as Borghese and is based in New York City. It has been run by CEO Georgette Mossbacher since 2000. Now, who's Georgette Mossbacher? She was born in 1947. And she's an American business executive, entrepreneur, political activist, author, and philanthropist for military veterans through her work with the Green Beret Foundation. Also chairman of Green Beret Foundation Advisory Board, she is known in the media as Fox as a Fox News contributor. Uh, President Obama nominated her as a member of the United States Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. Started her career as an executive in 1987 when she purchased the struggling cosmetic firm La Prairie, outbidding companies such as Revlon, Avon, and Estee Lauder. After selling La Prairie in 1991 to Beersdorf for a profit, she founded Georgette Mossbacker Enterprises, her own business and finance consulting company. Uh, from 2000 to 2015, she served as CEO of Borghese Cosmetics Manufacturing in New York City. She authored two motivational books for women in the 1990s, Feminine Force, through Simon & Schuster, and It Takes Money, Honey, through HarperCollins. She's active in American politics, previously served as the co-chair of the Republican National Committee's Finance Committee. She was the first woman to serve as the general chairman of the Republican Governors Association. She's a fellow at the Foreign Policy, uh, the Foreign Policy Association. She's a board member for the Business Executives for National Security and the Atlantic Council. Where does the uh, intersection of cosmetics and geopolitics play in? That would be a good example, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Just, um, and then, uh, yeah, this person's all, all in with, uh, what, uh, yeah, the Republic, uh, excuse me, the, uh, Trump campaign, the GOP. I, I don't know, but, I'll, but here, here's, here's what I know. It seems that royalty uh, runs throughout all of this in some way, um, whether it be American nobility or, uh, you know, uh, European royalty. And it's all through these uh, positions that if you go through history books, uh, which I have, all throughout mainline history books and things like that, it, it's always looked at that, that show people, entertainment people, are kind of frowned upon by the elite. Yeah. That those are those are people you don't want to you know mix with, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's a certain strata of those people that do believe that that they buy into that. But then there seems to be a certain strata of the of those people who know. Who are in who are in the know and don't mind, uh, if, uh, you know, someone like Brooke Shields. I mean, I, I mean, is is Brooke Shields like like one of the best actresses? No, right? No. Um. So uh, why would Brooke Shields, who also went to Princeton, by the way? She, uh, why would Brooke Shields, who was a model at first, remember she was a model, like, you know, on Cosmopolitan magazine and all that type of stuff? Yeah, I think she was um, some kind of cover girl, whatever the thing was back then. And she was uh, in, like, a magazine as a model, yeah, like, uh, even even as a teenager. I think she was doing that. Yeah, actually, she was, she was pretty controversial because... Um, Apparently, she was in, like, some, like, really risque French films when she was, like, 12 years old playing a prostitute. Oh, really? Yeah. So, so she's, got some bizarre, she's got some bizarre stuff in her background. And then uh, she had to testify before Congress that it wasn't actually her being used in the nude scenes for the Blue Lagoon because she was actually under age when they filmed that movie. And I guess people were up in arms because of the nude scenes. And, you know, I guess she was like 17 or something. And, you know, they had to say, well, yeah, that wasn't actually really her. 
but uh, yeah, just weird stuff. Um, but you could say that just having a uh, having to testify before Congress about nude scenes, or having um, just the idea of of a uh, of a young woman who's uh, before you know under age, that that is a cultural changing event played out in Massachusetts. Right, yeah. Well, you think about this, too. So you have, okay, in past times, you had the royal royal families and the, um, the, the uh, uh, oligarchies and the royalties and the, and the you know, pre, you know, uh, American Revolution and democracy and all that and all this nonsense. But then you have, I mean, you're uncovering here. Is this connection to these these celebrities, these people that are out in the public eye, and and royalty? So, I mean, there was you know this previous time where royalty would sort of be openly um, worshipped by the commoner, right? They would be, you know, they would be part of the you know now nowadays you know supposedly the royal family is like some sort of figurehead family or something like that even though the british you know the like the british or the you know they'll they'll have like uh almost this sort of reverence toward the royal family in some way even though they're supposed to be just you know titular heads they're not supposed to be uh, uh have any real power but then you see all these people that are connected to royalty and then celebrities and then that that could be seen as a way for them to be sort of worshiped in public without the the overt con- control in place you see what i'm saying oh yeah and i mean if you think about it like like take when um princess diana married prince charles right yeah and then and then yeah this emerge this kind of development of the the um celebrity royalty that's also yeah, exactly. celebrity and royalty. Now, now, most people won't remember this, and I don't even remember it, but I, I'm aware of it. Do you remember that that wedding was broadcast in America, live on television? Uh, yeah, so Princess Diana's wedding was televised in America. And, um, like, you know, it was, I, I, can't, I can't remember what it was. It was, like, early in the morning. You know, it was like three in the morning or something. They broadcast it. It was like a big deal. Like people actually woke up to watch this. And Princess Diana was a celebrity in America as much as she was in the UK, maybe even more so. Oh yeah, yeah. And and then you think about like how since that since that time period, all of the royals have become these like celebrities. Like you know, remember. Uh, Sarah Ferguson. Right. Like Sarah, Sarah Ferguson does like infomercials now. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> she does like she does like weight loss in commercials. Okay. Um and you know, with the new generation of royals coming up, you know, Prince Harry's always in the news, he's the bad boy. Uh uh, I think I saw something when I was looking up that uh, Kara uh, Delvin, a girl that she she's trading Twitters with Prince Harry, you know, so uh, which she would be of a bloodline being able to uh, uh, marry into such a family. But but you see, like like this is headline news that he's you know twittering back and forth with some actress. Right. Right. And and then of course you know uh, Kate Middleton is you know somewhat good looking uh, compared to the rest of the family she's uh, amazing looking. Um, right. Uh, so so she's a pop icon and her sister is all over the British tabloids and what whatnot as well. This is a celebrity royalty. So yeah, you are correct that that and. I mean, it's probably 
to a certain extent, always been that way. But we don't actually know, just the pop culture consumers, the mass media consumers, we don't actually know that the people that we are watching on television and in movies or singing, entertainment and whatnot, that those people are actually related to these people. Yeah, 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 that's kind of, yeah, it's not, it's not really, in a lot, like a lot of respects, it's not uh, really overt, it's just kind of, you know, it's, it's when you go into their bios or something, you know, you, you uncover this, and then somebody might be fixated on a particular celebrity, and then they say, oh, well, yeah, they're connected to, um, you know, it, it, you know Italian royalty or something like that, or in the case of Brookfield or something like that. And it's like, Oh, well, you know, just, just so happens. And then, but yeah, there's all these different ones out there that are yeah connected to royalty. Well, well, like take for, take for instance, one, one that everybody might know about is Anderson Cooper, right? Yeah. Vanderbilt. Right. He's a Vanderbilt, which the Vanderbilts are married into a, uh, a, uh, another family called the Whitney's um, which are married into another family called the Astors. Uh-huh. Um, I'm sure there's some Rockefellers and Carnegie's all, and Mellon's all mixed in there as well. Um, <clears throat> um, and then you take someone like Tucker Carlson. You know who Tucker Carlson is? Uh-huh. Of course, Alex Jones does Tucker Carlson on, on his show frequently now. That's uh Interesting. Uh, Tucker Carlson, the libertarian, allegedly. Right, right. The, uh, bow, the bow tie wearing uh, war pusher from NBC way back in the day. Um, uh, so his, uh, he is the heir to the J. William Fulbright fortune. Okay. Okay. So you've got two heirs. Of like American, uh, you know, robber baron uh, fortunes there. And why do they choose to become news guys? <laughs> right. yeah, well, no because, you know, why are they celebrity, you know, media personalities? Um, and this stems back to an earlier time period. I, I think I've brought this up before. There is a book. I'm, I'm remembering off the top of my head because it's a very interesting book. Um, I actually did not know this until I picked this book up. It is called The Children of the Sun. Okay. okay. And it is, it is written by a gentleman by the name of Martin Green. And it's kind of a rare book, so you, you might be able to find it. Um, but it goes into how the literary figureheads of the early uh, 20th century in England – and the people who went into uh, uh, what would later be the BBC and uh, fiction writers and all that stuff, they all came out of the aristocracy. They all came out of Eton. They came out of Cambridge. They came out of the upper echelons to be the guys uh, running the news and writing the fiction. So you think to yourself, why would an aristocrat want to write books? Well, if you're controlling the fiction and if you're controlling the news, like the guys at Eaton, they they used to have some slogan that gives you, I'm, I'm remembering off the top of my head, I don't know it, but it's like you couldn't be in the BBC unless you had gone to Eaton. Okay, and Eaton's like elitist. It's like, you know, George Orwell, Aldo Huxley, uh, uh, I, I can't remember all the people off the top of my head who uh, went there. Um, uh, the other guy we just talked about, I'm trying to think of, he's a spy, spy writer. Um, a current spy writer? No, um, I, I can't remember. It doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, D. H. Lawrence, maybe I think it was. Um, anyways, these these guys, uh, you couldn't work at the BBC unless you were like Eaton was your betting 
Eaton was like the place where they vetted you to work at PC. Oh, okay. Right? And, of course, uh, Eaton is where you get the London School of Economics, which is started by the Fabian Socialist Sidney and Beatrice Webb and uh, George Bernard Shaw. They started the London School of Economics. Okay. Of course, George Bernard Shaw, Fabian Socialist, but he's also a playwright. Right. So, once again, you have entertainment there. And so I think what we see through all of this is that the one who controls the entertainment is the one, you know, they say the one who uh, controls the past controls the future. Right. Well, I think it's the one who controls the entertainment controls the world. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it, yeah, it, it goes into, what we discuss a lot, how, you know, the, well, perception management and how, you know, the mass mind is shaped. And, uh, you know, it, we, we were talking about that with, uh, Jay Dyer before about the, um, and, and also, uh, um, was it, was it Hans Utter that we went into the, uh, uh, that was also, they discussed that on, on, on Jan Irving's podcast about the, uh, CIA and, and academia. How, like, like they had, uh. Yeah, spies, spies in academic clothes. Spies in academic clothing. And then, right. Yeah. How the, the CIA had, uh, written and rewritten a lot of, uh, you know, university publications and, and how they had, you know, uh, basically, kind of dominated the major academic outlets with, uh, with, uh, their, their publications. Yeah, that, that too. And, and, you know, it's, it, it someone might take this at face value from the, from the get go. Like I said, they're saying Lana Del Rey is involved in a conspiracy, right? And that's not what I'm saying. That's not what Chris is saying either. I'm not saying Miley Cyrus is part of some, some conspiracy. What I'm saying is that these are people who are involved with certain families that have certain connections. They get into certain echelons of power. And I do guarantee you that when it comes to towing particular lines, if, if, if somebody says, listen, uh, you're going to talk about uh, LGBTQQIIIAPP, whatever it is, stuff. Mm-hmm. And you're going to come you're gonna... out as, as what, what does she come out as sexual or, uh, sexually dimorphic? Like she's a, a um, trans or not a transsexual, but yeah, that kind of, yeah, yeah sexual, sexually fluid or whatever it is they call sexually it now. Fluid, yeah. So, um, yeah, you come out, um, you're going to toe the line on this agenda, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, and uh, you're making millions of dollars, you're not going to jeopardize that, and, um, you know, because, I mean, like, for, for instance, I've actually heard interviews with Katy Perry's dad, right? You can, you can find that on, on YouTube, where... Uh, Katie Perry's dad is getting interviewed on Alex Jones, right? And um, and yeah, he's saying, "Oh, Katie Perry's a good Christian girl." <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. And and so it's like, oh, okay, so so she's a great Christian role role model for you know girls, uh, you know, wearing um, a. a Topless, wearing wearing a shirt that barely covers her breasts on Sesame Street. Remember that? Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, you can go see that clip on YouTube of her on Sesame Street where she's got like a shirt that's barely covering her nipples. And uh, I mean, of course, she's got all the uh, occult stuff and all of her music videos and all that type of stuff. Whatever. I'm not really that concerned about that. What I'm saying is, is that the that these people are well connected and they're going to do what they're told 
and even if their parents are Christian pastors, um, they're making millions of dollars. Right. They're not going to they're not going to jeopardize that. And they come from a lineage of people who are already in power positions. You see, and you, some people might think that's insignificant, but it's not because you're already in that level, that strata of society. You're already in. You're like you're like grandfathered into that strata of society. Oh yeah, it's yes. about influence and uh, the, the setting. You know, you know. Now you may not be able to connect every celebrity out there to some sort of royal family or a connected family necessarily, but then you have the the major, uh, uh, you know, these, these ones you know identified as being sort of uh, setting, yeah, setting the tone or setting the or kind of establishing what what are the accepted norms and then the and establishing sort of the organizational culture so to speak so that they 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 steer the they steer that culture in a certain direction and then the rest of society and everybody that follows this pop culture they they they'll follow suit you know yeah, you can go to the school in New York City. It's called the uh, Tisch School. You ever heard of that? Tisch School. T i s c h. Lady Gaga went to the Tisch School. But if you if you look at the Tisch School, Tisch School of the Arts. Yeah, if you look at the Tisch School of the Arts, um, they've got a pretty good record uh, for churning out megastars. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, look at that roster of notable alumni. Can you imagine a school with that success rate? Well, it must be a really good school, John. <laughs> It's like everybody who comes out of that school is successful at whatever it is that they're going there for. It's, it's, I mean, that would be like the high school down the street from your house, just just like turning out uh, pop star celebrities, right? But, oh, no, that doesn't happen. But this school, it does happen. Uh, I'm going to read off a few. It's uh, Woody Allen, uh, Whoopi Goldberg, and Hathaway. Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Angelina Jolie, Martin Scorsese, Oliver Stone, <laughs> Alec Baldwin, Billy Crystal. Uh, just reading off the more noticeable ones. Uh, Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga. Got her in there. Uh, yeah, and then producers, directors, uh, a lot. Bridget Fonda. Uh, Fonda. She would be Peter to be Peter Fonda's daughter. Spike Lee. Uh... Spike Lee. That's an interesting one. You know, I I, I remember that Spike Lee went to Tish. Um, Spike Lee is always the uh, interesting. It's a very interesting character um, because uh, he's got this like academic career. He's got this academic background, right? Yet he's you know. These guys always baffle me, these, like, black directors who are from the streets. But then they've got this super elitist, like, academic background. Right? And then, like, Spike Lee's movies are basically just, like, out there to, like, promote racism. Right? Oh, real quick, guess who else? Um, Morgan Spurlock? Yeah, yeah, he went there, too. (laughs) I thought he was an independent uh, truth exposer. Uh, I, I actually did. I actually do like some of his films, but they are definitely like 
I'd have to say they're obfuscation type films, and they definitely come from a uh, left wing perspective. I mean, he I think he like interviews like Ralph Nader and Noam Chomsky in his movies. So yeah, but this is a yeah huge list. What M Night Shyamalan, Morgan Spur? Yeah, okay, I already said that. Uh, Adam Sandler, just on and on and on. So did so did Adam Sandler? Here's the real question: Did Adam Sandler go to that school to learn how to make the worst movies ever made? Is that, <laughs> is that is that what they taught him there? Like how to act like a buffoon? Yeah, the yes, and then yeah. What are we talking about? Are we talking about high art here? What are you talking about? You know, Adam Sandler films. I mean, my goodness. But yeah, it's it's just uh, low low brow trash culture. Oh yeah, that yeah. Uh, that article you sent me yeah, real quick. The that that was funny. The uh, the the uh, art display that they that the cleaning crew came in and threw in the trash. Yeah, that was that was posted up there by uh that was posted by the Lion on the uh on the comment section at Hoaxbusters, but um yeah I I forwarded it to you because it was so darn funny. Um because yeah, uh that. yeah. <laughs> it's, that's a good one. Yeah, you got, I mean that's not I mean that's the other thing too. And that's something uh, we'll get into on another call. But, you know, when you get into um, uh, the era of what you uh, call the method actors, uh, Marlon Brando, James Dean, the, uh, Marilyn Monroe, they all went to this uh, school called the Stra- Lee Strasberg School of Acting. And it's a very elitist school. Um, but it's a postmodernist method of acting, whereas before, prior to that, you had like these character actors who these guys. Um, and I, I'm not saying there's, uh, you, you know, we're all born into this postmodernist culture, so there's definitely aspects of this type of stuff I like. But the goal uh, of the method acting was to make it appear as if you're not acting. So it, it, you're, you're watching a movie that you're not supposed to be. Uh, you know, you're supposed to react and not read off the script. You're supposed to react like a real, like this was the method actor. React like you're a real person. Don't react like you're an actor. Okay, yeah, yeah. And it totally like changed the shape of acting. Ma- made for some, I mean, I don't think like people tend to think like James Dean or Marlon Brando are these like great actors. I mean, they're not that great of actors. You know, um, well, I, I like some of the I, I like some of their films in the past, but but them actually being like these brilliant actors, I mean, they're not. And so uh, that's what you find. I mean, uh, Marilyn Monroe went to the Strasburg School. I mean, Marilyn Monroe. I think actually Marilyn Monroe is probably a better actor than those guys. But um, but that's what you get is you get this shift away from an old style to where now it's open to where anything is uh, every anything is acting. Right, and acting is relative, and uh-huh. what you get with that is you get a uh, you get a uh, an art form where anybody can do it, and that's that's what you see a lot of. And I, I've heard this uh, postulated before: is that that they actually made it that way so that they could that um, that they could insert agents into those particular fields of art because. Those people were not real artists. They were not real musicians. They were not real actors. So they had to degrade all of those arts so that they could put people in who uh, were bad. <laughs> I don't know if that. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a funny theory. No, I would. Uh, I would say yeah. There's a lot to that. Um, yeah, I was watching this this film. I don't know if you have you ever heard of this movie. It's called cherry 2000 from it's it's like from 1984 with uh melanie griffiths in it and it and it's about um it, it's a dystopian film about the future it, where there's going to be like sex robots 
and and that's how and then you know it's it, people still um go to hookup clubs and stuff like that but then in order to like hook up with a, a, a guy or a gal you know you're out at the club you have to um engage you have to enter in some kind of legal contract it's it's it's, it's a pretty bizarre movie like but it, it it you know being from the 80s you know they got to check out every kind of dystopian i i am aware of this film yes i i so you're aware of it yeah I'm aware of it. I have not seen it though, but I, I do know what film you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, that, uh, uh, yeah, it's typical stuff from the, you know around that time, but uh, it's real schlocky and it's it, but it's uh, yeah, it it, it 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 it's got some interesting stuff in there. But um, yeah, the one you know the one thing that stood out I, I was watching that it's like you know Melanie Griffith she can't act worth shit. She is like absolutely horrible, you know. I wonder if she's connected to some kind of family or something. Well, you, you know, you know who Melanie Griffith's mom. You don't know who Melanie Griffith's mom was. Uh, no, no. Her no. name, her name, her name was Teppy Hedren. Okay. okay. And Teppy Hed, Teppy Hedren, uh, was one of uh, Alfred Hitchcock's muses. She was in that film, uh, she was in the Hitchcock film, Marnie, and she's also in The Birds. She's the blonde-haired lady in The Birds. Oh, okay. So that's, that's her that's daughter. That's Mel- <laughs> okay. Melanie Griffith is her daughter. And the interesting thing about Teppi Hedren is she made a, she made a wildcat preserve of her house out, out uh, I can't remember where it is. I think maybe it's in the valley. And she called it Shambhala. And it, she, she had like, she had like lions roam, roaming around on their house when like Melanie Griffiths was a little kid. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there, there's some weird. Melanie Griffith has a has a very strange background. There, there. I, I I can't remember off the top of my head what it is. Um. But uh, there's yeah, there's some there's some weird stuff in her background. I I do remember this. Um. I think it has to do with a uh, with a uh, preteen exploitation of some sort because she she's uh, was kind of pretty when she was younger. Um, I can't remember what it is, but uh, anyways, I'll have to go look it up. Yeah, yeah. If you watch that that movie, it's like yeah, that this woman cannot act. No, she crap. can't. And uh, you know, yeah, like, she's actually she's actually in a movie with John Goodman and the premise of the movie is that she can't act <laughs> and she wants to be a star, but she can't act. Have you ever, what is that movie called? Oh man. Um, I, I can't remember what that movie is, but that's, that's the premise of the movie. Like she wants to be a movie star, but, and, uh, of course, Don Johnson's in it. Hey, you're married, you, you married Don Johnson? I mean, you're married into Miami Vice royalty. That's the only royalty that really counts. <laughs> yeah. She was, she, she was married to Crockett. Crockett, yeah. It's pretty, uh, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's royalty in and of itself. I'm telling you. Yeah. But yeah, it's yeah. like uh, so. I mean, if there, yeah, you need any proof of that? That um, the, the you know, it's just all you need to do is have connections to get into the film. Then Melanie sure. Griffith would be a prime candidate because, because yeah, if you just watch that movie, it's like okay, this chick cannot act at all. I mean, she, she's just kind of just dead painting her lines, just kind of like you know, like it sounds like she's reading. That's how bad. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Or yeah, Arnold. Well, yeah, there you go, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, come on, Arnold Schwarzenegger. This you want to see? You want to see the best worst movie ever? Is Total Recall. Total Recall. That is, yeah, that's uh, that's good. One. That is that is that is the greatest. Uh, just reading the lines, not without any uh, emotion whatsoever. It's uh, when the guy when the guy with the uh, big uh, nerve sticking out of his face. Comes up, comes up to him and says, uh, "You've got a lot of nerve showing your face around here." And Schwarzenegger just says, "Look who's talking." (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, how does he become an actor? I mean, well, I mean, I guess it's just look, looks in his physique. But then, um, yeah, so then it, kind of the idea that you, that act, there's any kind of, like, real high standards to being an actor, no. it's just there's no, no evidence of that. It wasn't, his, wasn't his dad a uh, Nazi, like... Uh, Oh yeah, yeah. He, he connected to the not yeah, uh, Nazi general or something like that, right? Yeah, he his, his dad was like a, a Nazi, uh, a, an authentic Nazi belt buckle on the cover of uh, of, uh, of Time Magazine, Time Magazine with, with Michael Bloomberg, with a Michael Jew Bloomberg, next yeah. to him, a a Jew, a Jew billionaire, and he's wearing a Nazi belt buckle, and Michael Bloomberg doesn't care. <laughs> He, just, he doesn't even care. He's just like, yeah, this is cool. This guy's cool. He's a Nazi. That's cool. I'm a Jew, but that's cool because we both, uh, you know, we both uh, run in the same circles. It's fun. Yeah, it's kind of an insider joke, I guess. I, I don't know. It's, it's pretty over the top. And, it, and it's I've actually got, I've got a copy of that. I've got a copy of that magazine at my house that, that time. Oh, you do? Yeah, they're like standing on the cover. They're like best buds. Like they've got their arms around each other and they're like laughing. Like it's like the funniest thing. And he's actually like Arnold's actually got his thumb in the belt buckle, like pushing it forward. He's like, like got it. So like, like you're looking, like you actually look at it. It's like an order of the death said. I remember Jones used to make a big deal out of that, but it, it's true. It is. It's like a death said skull. Yeah, it's the skull. It's just like a skull and crossbones, and that's that's it, right? And then, in, um, yeah, right. Let's see if it's online here. Oh uh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, can't can't act. I I don't think he could it, it, as much acting as, as many movies as he's been in. He, he he still can't act, right? I mean, no. So yeah. <laughs> It uh, looked like he would pick something up eventually, you know, like he would kind of he would, he would accidentally think. get better, but no. Um, and if he, if he, let's, let's just say he's like a, he's like a Rothschild agent. We could act, since we saw that clip of uh, John Claude Van Damme, where he's uh, exposing the rock. Dude, I'm not even kidding. Every time I mention Rockefellers, uh, the call drops. Yeah. You gotta be careful. Man. We gotta come up with a code or something. That, <laughs> that doesn't happen. Yeah, so yeah. John Claude Van Damme. Yeah, he called out the the Rothschilds. Yeah. yeah well, so, he said, so yeah, maybe, Trump is not going to be president because the Rothschilds will never let that happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Give me a break. But um, but yeah, maybe we should have Jean Claude Van Damme like be on the Patriot side and Schwarzenegger be on the Rothschild side, and we could like have to duke it out in a movie. <laughs> Oh yeah, that would be good. Yeah, that'd be cool. But um all right. Well I think that uh concludes our special report on femme fatales here, so Yeah, that was a good one. Um so what is the what is what have we learned, John? Uh we've learned that uh all the world's a stage and we are merely players as the Shakespearean quote uh, says, right? And you don't necessarily have to be a player to be a a player. No, you're going to be a player. Yeah, the player, that means playa. All the world play. is a stage, and we are merely players. Actually, I think that's not that's not Shakespeare. That's Rush. That's, what it is. that's who that is. Oh, well, I, yeah, that's what I thought you were talking about, Rush. <laughs> But no, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah. I mean, if you need any more confirmation, yeah, just look at these so-called actors that absolutely cannot act worth the crap, and they can be made into major celebrities. Yeah. Remember, the Globe Theater and Shakespeare changed the changed the world with their acting. They changed the language. They changed the way people uh looked at entertainment it, it for its time period it shifted the culture so uh that's what you get uh a dis our entertainment is descended from 
So. All right. All right. Real until good, man. until next time, sir. All right. Good call, man. Really good. So. Exit left. Stage right. All right, man. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Bye.